In this session, I'd like to introduce you to one of my favourite models, which describes four different styles of supervision and when it's helpful to use them. It's based on Hersey and Blanchard's model of situational leadership, a model that invites you to analyse the needs of a situation you're dealing with and then adopt the most appropriate style of leadership. This can be adapted for supervision, discerning the learning needs of the supervisee and then adopting the most appropriate style of supervision. First of all, a quick look at the stages we go through as we learn a new skill or inhabit a new role. The first stage is one of unconscious incompetence. We don't yet know how much there is to learn. For instance, if we're learning to drive, the first time we sit in the driver's seat, we don't yet know what the pedals do, or the various buttons and dials. Until we have a go, we don't appreciate how tricky it is to coordinate clutch and accelerator and gear lever. It's only as we start learning that we realise how much more there is to learn how much more practice we will need before we're safe on the roads. This is the stage of conscious incompetence. Then, as we gain experience, we get better at controlling the car, but it still requires all our concentration and conscious thought. For instance, as we approach a roundabout, we might be thinking, OK, so I need to indicate that's this lever here and move over to the right hand lane. That means checking mirror now change down from fourth gear to third. That means brake, clutch, gear lever. That level is conscious competence. We know how to drive, but we still need the support of a teacher beside us to keep an eye on us to give us confidence, to direct us where necessary. Finally, we reach the stage of unconscious competence. Here, we do things well without having to think hard about them. Driving is second nature. We're able to concentrate on the route, not just the road in front of us. We can cope with the unexpected, we don't reach this stage until some time after we've passed our test. This only comes as a result of practice, experience, and probably learning from a few mistakes along the way. It's possible for the same person to be in all four different levels at the same time, in different skills. Apply this to the curates. Most will be in stage one when it comes to taking a funeral. They should all have some limited experience of preaching, maybe level two or level three. But some will bring their particular areas of expertise. For instance, they might have been a youth worker for some years before they were ordained. In that case, they'll be in level four. This is why it's a good exercise to get a measure of the curate's previous experience right at the start of the curacy. They will appreciate having their past experience acknowledged and valued, and it helps to reveal the areas of ministry where they are starting from scratch and will be low in confidence. Each of these learning styles, learning stages, calls for a different style of supervision. If the curate is in, in learning stage one, it's appropriate for you to adopt what's called a directing style of supervision. The first time they do something, you'll probably show them how to do it. You'll keep your directions clear and simple. This is the way I'd like you to do it. Another word used for this style is telling. 
The second stage is called a coaching style. But this is more in the sense of a sports coach. At this stage, the supervisor might say, you have a go and I'll watch and give you feedback. And then when the supervisor has observed, they might say, this was fine and that was good, but I think you need to work on this particular part of the task. In stage one, the supervisor gave one clear way to do something for the first time. It helps at that stage to be unambiguous and simple. But in the second stage, the supervisor might help the curate to explore alternatives, different resources, moving on from do it this way to try out what works best for you. As a curate gains confidence, we move on to stage three. By now the curate is doing things without being observed, but they still value support and the chance to reflect on their experiences. The supervisor's attitude here might be, you lead, you, lead, you lead this on your own, but I'm also happy to run through any questions you have when you're preparing, and I'd like us to go through it afterwards so you can tell me how it went. The supervisor has become a resource, actively making themselves available to support, but showing a large element of trust in the curate's ability. Finally, we reach the stage where the supervisor is delegating control and decisions to the curate. The supervisor is still available to support, but the initiative is with the curate to seek out that support rather than with the supervisor to offer it. The attitude here might be, you take charge of this piece of work and tell me when you'd like any help from me. I trust you to get on with it, but I'm here if you need me. Even then, the supervisor should still ask how things are going. Not to check up, but to show interest. There's a real skill in discerning where the curate's learning needs are in any area of ministry and responding with the most helpful style of supervision. I know I've made the mistake of overestimating a curate's confidence and omitting the directing stage. They may only need it once, but the first time a curate does something, like for instance leading BCP Evensong, they can feel lost and unsupported without directions like you stand here, you kneel here, the organist gives you a note here, and so on. On the other hand, some training incumbents can make the reverse mistake of treating the curate as a beginner when they actually need a less directive style of supervision. And perhaps the most common mistake is to jump from directing to delegating, skipping stages two and three. I've known a tra training incumbent say to a curate, right, you've done your first funeral with me, from now on you're flying solo, and then simply leave them to it. That particular curate expressed her frustration to me. She said, I can see my incumbent's an expert, and I'm still a beginner, and I need their help to bridge that gap from where I am to where they are. In reality, of course, there is no clear boundary between stage one and stage two, or between stage two and stage three. The whole thing is much more fluid than that. And progress is not always linear. A curate might think they're doing fine and feel quite independent and then they encounter a tricky situation and their confidence takes a knock. In the same way, the supervisor has to be ready to retrace a stage or two in response to the curate's needs. One final explanation of the graph. 
people often say to me, why does it start with stage one in the bottom right hand corner? The answer is because of the two axes. The horizontal axis goes from low direction to high direction. The vertical axis goes from low support to high support. So in stage one, the supervisor's style is high on direction, but low on support, because the curate is not required to take a lead at this stage. In stage two, the supervisor's style is high on direction. The curate still needs to know that you're in control, but high on support, as you encourage them to take more of a lead. In stage three, the supervisor's style is low on direction, as you hand over responsibility to the curate, but high on support, so they know they have your backing and help. And in stage four, your style is low on direction and low on support. In acknowledgement, they no longer need your help and value the trust you place in them. When they're comfortably operating in stage four, in most areas of ministry, then you can confidently recommend they're ready to move on to their next role.